Thank you, Jesse, for leading us. Let's turn our Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I'm going to start out with a series of questions. Uh-oh. Let's see. Yeah, let's see how well I've been teaching. What was your homework from two weeks ago that I mentioned again last week? What was your homework? Yes. Memorize the Ten Commandments. Excellent. Thank you. So I hope you took some time to do that. We're going to go through those tonight uh, briefly. Uh, we're not actually going to spend as much time on those because you've already memorized them. And uh, I don't need to take a lot of time re- re- referring to those, but I do want to talk about how we're going to use those. Now, we've been looking at some answers for America, and I am convinced, I hope you are convinced, that one of the answers for America is the Ten Commandments. Amen. Right? Why do we have people breaking into stores and stealing stuff out of it? Because they've never been told, thou shalt not steal. Why do we have people killing each other? Because they don't believe that God is right when he says, thou shalt not kill. Why do we so, see so much uh, confusion about sexuality in our society? It starts with, thou shalt not commit adultery. When that went out the window and we open the floodgates to whatever we felt like doing, we end up in a place where people don't even know truth anymore. Right. So the Ten Commandments lay a foundation for a lot of the problems, lay a foundation for fixing a lot of the problems we see in our society. But I want to make sure you understand how to use those. Now, what are some other answers for America that we've already looked at previous Sunday mornings, previous Sunday nights? Fathers. Yeah, fathers. Fathers engaged with their children. Fathers loving uh, their wives, loving their, their children's mothers. Fathers investing in their families. That's excellent. What else do we talk about? What's that? Yeah, we should be a light. And and, and by a light, we looked at Ephesians 5, reproving those works of darkness, taking God's word and not being ashamed. I appreciate your testimony tonight, Roberto. Not being ashamed to say, this is what God's word says. People laugh. You believe that stuff? Yes. What do they believe? that they can figure out in their own heads? Seriously, I've I've been a little ways down that road and I feel badly for those people that are so smart, I'm not so smart, but that are so smart, their own intelligence gets in their way of just taking God's word at face value and living by faith. They They think they can figure it all out. And this world is just too big. There's just too many complications for any one man's mind to figure it all out. Okay, that's good. What else have we talked about? Answers for America. Love. Yeah, we definitely need to love one another. I need to write that down. That's a good topic. What else? Yes, Sheila. Yeah, that God's in, in charge. Yeah, God's sovereignty. sovereignty yeah, God's in charge. No, that's a good way to put it. God's in charge. Don't forget that. Because I don't know about you, sometimes I watch the news and I feel like, who is in charge here? Well, you know what's neat? God is using even sinful man's uh, wicked choices to bring honor and glory to himself. And he is going to weave this tapestry together. It's going to be a beautiful tapestry. Our problem is we're looking at the back of the tapestry and we're about a half an inch away from it. So all we see are the knots. But when we get to heaven, we're gonna step back from that wall. We're gonna see the tapestry laid out from, from Adam to Jesus' second return. And we're gonna say, praise the Lord, he worked it all out. So he is in charge. Good, what else have we learned? Oh, come on. We've got eight or nine of these so far. What else? True freedom. Yeah, true freedom. True freedom doesn't come from doing what I want to do, what I feel like doing. True freedom comes from following God's law. Good. One one or two more. Someone who hasn't answered yet. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is definitely uh, an important aspect of this. We must, I, I hope, uh, that this coronavirus crisis has challenged your prayer life. I've had multiple uh, Christians say to me, I I can't believe some of the things that have happened during this crisis. Uh, For for example, telling churches that they cannot meet, and and just a whole lot of other things that politically seem crazy. Uh, Letting the abortion clinic stay open, but telling churches they cannot meet. That just doesn't make sense to us. I hope that drives you to prayer. You can get frustrated, you can throw your hands up. What we need to do is pray. And I hope you're taking more time to pray. 
So one of the answers, though, is the Ten Commandments, and let's get into this tonight. Um, you are here in Exodus chapter 20, and uh, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for not leaving us without a lamp. Uh, thank you for giving us a light that directs our path. And our, our, our desire tonight, what we ask of you tonight, is to open our eyes, soften our hearts, and may we just relish and enjoy being in your word. Bless these little ones that are with us. Bless these teenagers, the, the, the adults, the, the senior saints among us. Give every one of us hope for the future, uh, a sense of your uh, presence and your guidance in our lives. And we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, just again this week, I was reminded, WT reminded me, somebody had posted on, on our uh, webpage, our, our Facebook page, actually, uh, that we are a legalistic church. So let's just start with this. I believe God has laws and we ought to follow them. Amen. Uh, some churches have, have, have intentionally said we're not going to talk about sin. We're not going to talk about a man being wicked. That doesn't help us. It's like going to the doctor and saying, and you're sick and you just don't feel well, and saying, doctor, what's wrong with me? He says, you know, you have such an amazing body. And you say, yeah, I know that, but what's wrong with me? You know, it has this ability to heal itself. And, and that's true, by the way. You say, yeah, I know, but what's wrong with me? And, and what you need to do is you just need to relax. Everything's going to be okay. You know what? You'd go get a second opinion, wouldn't you? I hope you would. But people will come to church and feel better about themselves because we say, God loves you, and he's going to work it all out, and just go home and rest in that. Well, those are true statements. And, and don't misunderstand me. I, God loves us. He does control all things. We already talked about that. But sometimes the problem, a lot of times the problem is me. I, I always like to blame things on my wife and my kids. I'm missing my tie. You may realize I'm wearing a different tie tonight. I've misplaced my tie. And I would like to say it's my wife's fault. It's my kid's fault. It's my cat that drug that tie somewhere. No, I'll tell you, I've placed that tie somewhere. I don't know. And this week, I'll come across it and think, why did I put the tie on the bathroom counter? Or something like that. And that's true in life. I want to blame everybody else. And most of the time, when I have friction in my life, the problem starts with me. Now, there may be a person who's also involved, but if I will change my attitude, and I will let God's grace flow through me, it's amazing how many times God changes their attitude, and God's grace flows through them, and we get it solved. So it, it would be wrong for me to just say to you, don't worry, you know, God's going to work it all out when he's given us some very specific reasons, some very specific rules uh, uh, that, that will help us. Now, having said that, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm quite, I'm the type of person I, I like to know what the rules are. I think this is one of the reasons I've always enjoyed sports. I like to know what the rules are. You tell me what the rules are. Let's play within the rules. Or if I don't like the game, I think it's stupid. I just won't even play. But, but let's know what the rules are. Some of you may be less like that. Maybe you don't care what the rules are. So the Ten Commandments has always appealed to me. But I want to show you something that was brought to my attention a couple years ago that really changed the way I look at the Ten Commandments. You're in Exodus chapter 20. Look at verse 2. Here's where it be. Well, it's verse 1. God spake all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God. That's where he starts. I am the Lord thy God. What rule is that? That's not a rule at all, is it? Because the Ten Commandments don't start with the rules. The Ten Commandments, and this is what I want you to understand about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments start with relationship. I am the Lord thy God. I'm about to tell you a list of rules, but let's start here. You have a relationship with me. I am God, and you are my people. Now, that changes everything. That really does. It changes everything. Um, uh, can you imagine if somebody said to you, you can't play basketball. Now, some of you ladies are going to be like, I don't care about any of this. But, but some of you men, follow me here. Let's imagine uh, somebody told you, some of you men, you can't play basketball. You can't play baseball. You can't go jet skiing. You can't play, you can't go bowling. I think a lot of us would be pretty upset. We'd say, no, wait a minute. 
Who are you to tell me what to do? But maybe you didn't realize that that was written into Patrick Mahomes' $500 million contract. That changes the context, doesn't it? They don't want him to injure himself playing other sports. They want him to be available to play football. When God gives us these rules, it's not because he hates us. He wants us to be available to serve him. Right. And if I'm not keeping these rules, it's really hard to serve God. It's really hard to serve God if I'm unfaithful to my wife. It's really hard to serve God if you wonder every time I open my mouth, am I telling you the truth or is this another story? Now, my family will tell you, I, I do this to them all the time. They'll ask a question about something, you know, about the economy. And I will come back with an amazing story. But half of the time, those stories are lies. Now, we do this at the dinner table for fun, okay? So now they don't believe me when I tell them the truth. <laughs> just this, uh, just this uh, afternoon, we were talking about generations. And my daughter said, you know, we have a Generation X. And we have a, the, the boomer generation. We have Generation Millennials and all this. She said, what was before the, the greatest generation, which was the generation before the boomers. And I had an answer for it just like that. And it was wrong. It was not the silent generation, which we found out was the right answer. You know what? That's made my children very suspicious that in, when we're having these type of conversations, is dad telling us the truth or not? Now, it doesn't bother me because this is just table talk. We're just enjoying each other's company. But if as your pastor, you came to me and you say, Pastor, what does the scripture say? And half the time I told you a lie, it would make it really hard for me to serve the Lord. With. So when we come to the Ten Commandments, it's not about the rules, it's about the relationship. And God has put out a contract, I, that makes it sound like a hit, okay, but has given us a contract that basically says, listen, I'm God, I love you, so here's some things you're not going to benefit from doing. I'm just going to make this really easy for you. You do these things, it'll ruin our relationship. Doesn't that put it in a different context? Now, I love the rules. And I said, just tell me what the rules are. I don't need the relationship. I'm telling you tonight, you need the relationship with God. If you're really good at keeping rules and you say, well, I can keep all these rules, you'll be no different than the rich young ruler who came running to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, keep the rules. And he lists a couple. And the young man says, yeah, I've kept all those from my youth. And I'm thinking, he's lying. <laughs> because for him, it was about the rules and not the relationship. So it's about a relationship. Second thing, we're not even to the rules yet. Look also in verse 2. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. What has God already done for the Israelites? Before he's even given them the rules, what has he already done? Anybody, just yell it out. He's given them freedom. I'm going to use the word redemption so it has an R in it. But he has freed them from slavery. When God saved you, what did he do? He freed you from sin. Don't go back to it. This is the mistake so many Christians make. It breaks my heart. God says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then, like a... And I'll use the scriptural uh, illustration. Like a dog returning to its vomit, they just go back into sin. Why? Why, when God has given us freedom from sin, would we want to go back to sin? By the way, I've, I've already gotten ahead of myself. I want to show you, in, this, in, the, in these rules, God not only tells us what we ought to do, he tells us what kind of God he is. So let's look at that as we think about the relationship here. Verse 2, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. That shows us two things. Number one, it shows us he's a powerful God. Because here's Egypt, the world power of the, of the day. And God sends ten plagues that bring Pharaoh to say, not only you can go, you can go, but get out of here. And Pharaoh changes his mind very rapidly, sends the chariots of Egypt after the Israelites, and then what does God do? God parts the Red Sea, allows the Israelites to cross, and as the Egyptians start in, brings the water back over them and destroys that Egyptian army. That's power. Number two, it shows it's a God of redemption, a God who frees his people. Verse five shows us that he's a jealous God. 
For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Why is it that God doesn't want us to worship other gods? He's a jealous God. Now, jealousy is typically wrong, and we preach against jealousy, but in the right relationship, jealous, jealous, there's nothing wrong with jealousy. I hope my wife is jealous that I would be faithful to her. I'm certainly jealous that she'd be faithful to me. And I'm grateful for a, for a wife. I don't worry about it. I hope that's true with you and your spouse. Amen. It's a relationship. God says, I'm a jealous God. Verse uh, 6, he's a merciful God, showing mercy. Um, verse 7, he's a just God. The Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. He says, I'm going to judge evil. Uh, verse 12, he's a generous God because he says that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to be generous to you. So you see how this is not just about rules. It's about a relationship. God says, this is the type of God I am, and this is the type of people I want you to be. Then we move on to redemption. And God says, I've already saved you. I've saved you out of Egypt. I've, I've saved you out of bondage. And that's, although we haven't been saved from slavery in Egypt, we have been saved from slavery, from bondage to sin. Romans 6, 17 tells us, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered you, being then made free from sin. So God has freed us from sin. And then he gets to the rules. Now, you've already memorized these, right? Yes. Okay, good. So you don't, need to, you don't need to be told what they all are. But I want to give you a, 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 a mnemonic device, not demonic, a mnemonic, which means a memory aid to remember these. So everyone hold up one finger, okay? First commandment. Everyone hold up one finger. You can do this. You can do this. Come on. One finger. Okay. Only worship one God. That's the first one. Only worship one God. I'm going to yeah. give you this in a second here. <coughs> here we are. There we are. Only worship one God. Here's the second com com commandment. Remember scissors? He says, don't make idols. In fact, that word there in, in verse 4, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, the root of that word means to cut. Now, it could, doesn't necessarily mean scissors. It could be to will like wood or to chip away with a chisel on a, on, a, on a stone. But to cut. Don't make idols. Now, how many of you grew up Catholic? You realize that Catholics have a different way of dividing up these Ten Commandments? So that they don't have this second commandment. They skip over don't make idols. They go right to the third commandment. And then you say, well, how do they get ten? They break the tenth commandment into do not covet your neighbor's wife. And secondly, do not covet your neighbor's stuff. But I, that's not the way the Bible breaks it up. So don't make <laughs> idols. Do you think the Catholics have a reason for doing that? I believe they do. But let's move on. Number three. You've got a three. You've got a W, the letter W. Watch your words. Specifically, God says, don't take my name in vain. By the way, that applies today. And I, I hope you are very careful about how you speak with others. What you post on the internet. We were dealing with young people in, in Oregon, and sometimes we'd be looking at their social media posts, and they would have the letters OMG as part of their post. Now, just so you know, that is taking the name, Lord's name in vain. And I think it's just safest if we just stay away from all that. I, I personally try to stay away from euphemisms, <laughs> G's and gosh and all that. But whatever the Spirit leads you to do, God says, watch your words. He says, I will not hold him guiltless that takes my name in vain. He's very serious about this. Okay? So watch your words. Here's number four. This is the hardest one. But let's use it this way. Sunday is for God. Now, I know that this is the Sabbath. This is Saturday. If you want to have a discussion about the Sabbath, that's fine. By the way, there are Sabbath-keeping Baptists. I'm not one. Uh, but I believe that it, it's a blessing to us when we set aside one day to worship God and to rest. God made, us, made, us mirac made our bodies in a miraculous way. And you can just go and go and go and go. But people who take one day to rest and worship God, 
God will bless you for that. I, I have some stories, but I won't tell them tonight. So Sunday is for God. So number one, say it with me. Only worship one God. Okay, number two, don't make idols. Number three, watch your words. Num number four, Sunday is for God. I know, but it's hard for me to memorize all the vows and all the veins. And, and so I like to just tell people, watch your words. They can understand that. That's a little bit simpler. And I, I admit, I'm boiling it down. That's not what the text says. But guess what you did for homework? You memorized them, didn't you? So you don't need to memorize them again. I'm just trying to help you out here. Here's, by the way, you know where this comes from, this sermon comes from? When I was a young man, I had just started working in a church as an assistant pastor. We had a visitor come to the service, and uh, he met with me after the service. I was just meeting with people. He started asking me questions. He says, do you know the Ten Commandments? I said, well, I mean, yeah. He said, well, go ahead, give them to me in order. <laughs> well, you know, worship the Lord your God and, and, and uh, don't make any graven image. And um, that was about as far as I got. And, and honor your father and mother is in there somewhere. <laughs> he said, you know, we keep saying how important the Ten Commandments are, but we can't even say them. So if you can't say them, I'm trying to help you. If you can't say them, you can just tune out for a second. We're going to come back in a minute. Here's number five. If you've been in the military, you start with a salute. It's all five fingers, right? Honor your father and mother. Number six, think of this as a bullet, and this is a person, right? You don't shoot people. So don't kill. I always, when I'm teaching this to kids, I always say you should do some sort of sound effect for a bullet, right? Don't kill, okay? Number seven, this is so much fun. I was teaching elementary school kids this one time. And a parent came to me a couple days later. He said, I'm so glad you're teaching my children the Ten Commandments. I said, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. He said, especially the one about not committing adultery. He said, then I had to explain to my child what adultery was. Because she came home and said, Dad, what is adultery? Well, that's for you parents to explain. But the Seventh Commandment is, don't commit adultery. And for these little ones, I said, listen, you got one man. He ought not to have two women. You have one woman. She ought not to have two men. That's just the way God made it. Okay, here's eight. I showed this to you last week. You gotta have four fingers on this hand, and four fingers on this hand, that makes eight. And when you bump them together, switch one of these fingers, put this one down, put this one out, and it looks like what? Don't steal. Don't steal. Kenzie is even doing it back there. Good job, keep it up. Don't, and yeah, I see two, good, here we go. So let's do that together. Let's say it with me, don't steal. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. Only worship one God. Don't make idols. Some of you are saying it with me. The rest of you need to join us. Watch your words. Sunday is for God. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, don't kill. Number seven, don't commit adultery. Number eight, don't steal. Number nine, you have two children. One child says, it was four. The other child says, it was five. Guess what? One of them is lying. So ninth commandment, obviously, don't bear false witness, but I like to boil it down to don't lie. By the way, some people have tried to make a distinction between bearing false witness and lying. If you would like to do that, that's fine. But the New Testament gives us a commandment, don't lie not one to another. So don't lie. Here's the last one. You have all ten fingers. You want to grab as much as you can because you are greedy. So tell people, don't be greedy. Okay, so those are the Ten Commandments. But God also gives us in those Ten Commandments, He gives us some, oh, I'm going to go back. He gives us some rewards. What is that reward that He gives us? Verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now this is the only commandment in the Ten Commandments where God gives a promise, uh, a blessing. <clears throat> well, I shouldn't say that exactly. That's what Ephesians tells us. There's some other blessings that are in this passage, so let me speak carefully. But this is the commandment that comes with a promise that if you'll honor your father and mother, your days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. Because it's not just about the relationship. It's not just about God redeeming us. It's not just about the rules. We serve a God who rewards those who seek Him. 
Hebrews 11.6 Without faith it is impossible to please God. For they that come to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I mentioned priorities this morning, and I don't think this should be our highest priority. But for those of you young people who are wondering, is it worth it to serve God? The answer is unequivocally yes. Yes. I grew up in a Christian home. They sent me to a Christian school almost my entire uh, career. I went to a Christian college. I grew up with a lot of young people who, just like me, were second-generation Christians. And many of them went to Christian school because their parents made them. Some of them even went to a Christian college because their parents made them. But at some point they said, you know what? I don't think serving God is worth it. I'm going to go my own way. Some of them have come back to me and said, I really regret going my own way. Some of them have said, you know, I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow close after him. I've never had one of those come back to me and say, I regret following God. <laughs> because life isn't just all about money. It's not just all about experiences. It's just all about what you can get out of life. I have some, some people, my peers, boy, they've made a lot more money, a lot, a lot more money in life than I've made. More money than I can even imagine some of them. Great, I'm happy for them. But they didn't follow the Lord, and the money has not made them happy. That's right. People that have traveled the world, seen all kinds of things that I'll never see. And I'm happy for them. I'm, I'm not against traveling the world, but they're not happy because traveling the world does not make one happy. Men that have been much more um, prodigal than I've been and, and promiscuous than I've been, and, and, and they thought that was going to make them happy. It's not made them happy. God blesses those who keep his law. There's rewards to that. Now, the last thing I want to do, let's go to Matthew chapter 5. And I want to show you that Jesus amplifies these Ten Commandments. Because sometimes we get the idea, well, there's two more things. But this is sort of uh, getting ready for the last one here. Sometimes we say to ourselves, well, I can keep those commandments. You know, I'll, I'll worship one God and I won't make any idols and I won't take his name in vain. And uh, I'll, I'll honor the Sabbath day. I'll honor my father and mother. I haven't killed anybody. I'm not going to commit adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't lied. I'm not going to be greedy. But Jesus helps us understand that it's more than that. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees have been very scrupulous, scrupulous about keeping this law. But what they forgot is that God sees the heart. Right. So the first uh, amplification Jesus gives in verse 21, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. He's quoting the Ten Commandments. Now he's going to quote from the rabbis, And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now I can tell you in a court of law, I could not be honestly convicted of killing anyone. I have never killed anyone. But I've been angry with my brother without a cause. That's something that goes on in my heart and in my head. And Jesus says, maybe you haven't killed anybody, but if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you are in danger of the judgment. If you say to your brother, Raka, uh, you might use this word, the word we would use in our home that we should not have used was idiot. You ever called your brother an idiot? Your sister an idiot? You idiot! I can't believe Jesus says, if you say that, you shall be in danger of the council. Thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. What is God telling us? What is Jesus telling us? It's not just about what we do. It's about what we think and about how we feel about people. Uh, there's a lot more that can be said, but let's skip down to verse 27. Jesus amplifies another commandment. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Which number commandment is that? Seven. Right. One guy shouldn't have two women. Right? Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He says, okay, you know, maybe you're faithful to your wife, but listen, if your heart... And in your mind, 
You're lusting after another woman, a woman who's not your wife. You have committed adultery. Jesus amplifies these. So the next time you're sharing the Ten Commandments with someone, and they might say to you, and I've had people say this to me, they're being sincere, yeah, I've kept all those. It might help you to amplify them as Jesus did. Say, well, you know what Jesus said? Not only is it not enough not to kill, you also have to keep your heart free from being angry with your brother without a cause. Not only do you not commit adultery, you also have to keep it out of your head and out of your heart. And you can share these verses with it. But here's where I want to leave. So how do we use the Ten Commandments? 1 Timothy chapter 1. And this is where we will end tonight. 1 Timothy chapter 1. But all that that I just gave you is introduction. <laughs> yeah, that's not true. How do we use the law? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. 1 Timothy 1, 8. God says, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Okay, so what is the lawful use of the, of the law? Verse 9, knowing this, that the law was not made for the right for a righteous man. In other words, it's not made to show that you're a righteous person. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. God's telling us there, the way you use the law is to show people how bad they really are. The law doesn't show you how good I am. I don't go around and say, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time I keep the Ten Commandments, and I just break the unimportant ones, like only worship one God. So I'm a pretty good person. That's not what the law does. It's not made for the righteous. The law is made for the unlawful and the unrighteous. It's that bright light that shines, and all of a sudden you see the cockroaches go running for cover. <coughs> You say, well, see, I don't have any cockroaches. Yeah, you do. They've just been hiding. Mm -hmm. As soon as you turn that light off, they're going to be back out. Good. That light is the law. So when I am witnessing to someone, I, I, unless I know their background and I know they're already under conviction for sin, I try to ask them some questions. Do you, do you lie? Do you, I don't usually ask, do you commit adultery or do you kill? Because that's pretty offensive. But do you lie? Are you greedy? Have you, all your life, have you only worshipped the one true God? If people are frank and honest, they're going to realize they don't measure up to God's standard. And that's not surprising, because what does the Bible say? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there is none righteous. There is no, not one. The law helps us to see that. This is why our nation needs the Ten Commandments, because it needs to realize how far it's deviated from God's law. We don't need the Ten Commandments to keep them. If you go to your coworker and say, okay, here, I'm going to give you Ten Commandments, and if you keep all ten of them, God will let you into heaven. You have lied to him. That's not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. You go to your coworker, you say, let me tell you what God's Ten Commandments are, and when he says, nobody can keep that, you say, exactly. That's why Jesus had to die. Because nobody can keep it. And because God is a holy God, um, it tells us that he's just in the Ten Commandments, verse 7, uh, Exodus 20, verse 7, he will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. So Jesus, to me, so God the Father must punish sin. And Jesus is the one who took that punishment. And he died in my place. You see, I'll be frank, as I witness to people, a lot of them don't get why Jesus had to die. To them, maybe if they've studied some history or they know a little bit of their Bible, it's often simply because he was a, a political opponent of, of, of Caesar or he's a political opponent of the Jewish council, and so they killed him because they didn't want him to be around. That is not, I mean, it's historically accurate that they killed him, but that's not the reason he had to die. He says to us, he could have called 10,000 angels, he could have called legions of angels to free him. But he willingly went to the cross because you are a sinner, I am a sinner, the people out there, they're sinners. Our nation needs to hear that there's a God in heaven that he's holy, that he's told us exactly what we have to do, and none of us measure up. 
That's how we use the law. And that's why it's important for you to know what the Ten Commandments are. Because there are a few people, but a majority of Americans have some idea that there's Ten Commandments out there. They won't know what they are. But you're free to say, now listen, let, let me lead you through this. Only worship one God. Don't make idols. Watch your words. Sunday is for God. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't be greedy. And they'll say to you, how do you remember those? You say, let me show you. <laughs> Lift up one thing, right? Okay. Here's my point. That's what the Holy Spirit can use to put them under conviction that they'll never measure up to that state. You know, a lot of people, they think they're, they're pretty good people. I mean, they're not the ones that are out there breaking into stores and looting. They're, they haven't shot anybody. And I, I've had men say to me, I've been faithful to my wife. Those are good things. I don't want to discount those. But what did Jesus say? He says that if I'm angry with my brother without a cause, I'm in danger of judgment. If I just look on a woman to lust after her, then, then I'm in danger of judgment. Can you keep that law? The truth is none of us can. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Here's my point. Take this home. Take this to your workplace. Take this to your neighborhood. The people around you need to know that there is a holy God, that he's given us a law. More than just the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments, they're enough to get people to the point they realize they're never going to meet God's day. And that's the point. Even when Moses brought those laws down from Mount Sinai, God knew his people could not keep those laws. That's Exodus chapter 20. What happens in Exodus chapter 32? They make a golden calf. And even if you say, and, and some scholars say, well, they were trying to worship Jehovah through the golden calf. Yeah, but what about don't make idols? They knew better. And they still chose to sin. And the truth is, I know better, you know better. The world knows better. God's written the law in our hearts. Let's use the law to shine that light on, on people's cockroaches, which is a terrible thing. So that they say, yeah, I need Jesus Christ to be my Savior from sin. That's your homework this week. And that's my homework this week. Finding someone to share the Ten Commandments with. If the Ten Commandments is the answer for America, and we don't fruit in the we don't help anybody. Let's open our mouths. Tell them, listen, let me share with you the Ten Commandments. If you want to, put it on me. Say, you know, my pastor gave me some homework this week. Can I tell you what my homework is? And I'll say, what? Share the Ten Commandments. Only worship one God. Don't make idols. Give them all Ten Commandments. See if the Lord will open up that door of opportunity for you to tell them there is a Savior from sin, Jesus Christ. He died so that you and I can be righteous, so that we can be forgiven and have eternal life. How many of you, seriously, think about this, how many of you will attempt this week to share the Ten Commandments with somebody? Just attempt it. Just try it. And if you get to only worship one God, they say, get back to work. Then get back to work. But at least try it. <laughs> Father in heaven, I, I'm grateful that you tell us to uh, that our, our, our speech should always be seasoned with salt. That we should have grace in our speech. And I know, Father, personally, it's so hard for me sometimes to get into the gospel, but to know where to jump into it. And, and I ask that you would show us this week that there are fields white and a harvest. As Roberto was bold to say, before I give you this check, I need to tell you something. Help us to be bold, to open our mouths and use the opportunities we have to share the gospel. And when people shut us down, when people tell us to shut up, when people reject you, give us grace to recognize that they are in danger of hell fire. We're not the ones that are in trouble. Give us boldness. Help us to be harmless as doves and, and wise as serpents to share your gospel with people this week. Open up those doors of opportunity. We pray. Because we believe that your son, Jesus Christ, is the answer for our country. And we want to get his name out there as the solution to man's sin problem. So we pray that you'd help us, help us to be just as sweet as we can, as kind as we can, loving people, loving you. And for ourselves, Lord, may we focus on the relationship with you. 
that the Ten Commandments aren't a bunch of rules to play a game. They're, they're rules to know how we can stay in a right relationship with you, to walk in the light as you are in the light, and to have that fellowship with you and with each other. I pray for those that are not able to come to the services in person. And I ask that you would pour out your grace and your blessing on them. Give them peace. Bring them to your house in your time to fellowship with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.